Vladimir Putin. Part 6 We continue our exploration of Vladimir Putin to understand what he is, to understand his behaviours and what they denote. Please ensure you like this video, and that you share them, and ensure other people are directed to them to aid their understanding and analysis of famous individuals. We now turn to the particular mindset effect and its impact upon Vladimir Putin with regard to the fall of the former Soviet Union. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union stood for nearly half a century as one of the two loads of global power. When it dissolved in 1991, Russia found itself losing relevance. Russian President Vladimir Putin was a young KGB officer during this era, and the events of that time influenced many of the moves that he made in the early years of his administration, with the goal of regaining the importance in the world the Soviet Union used to hold and restoring Russian pride. Pride, of course, is a narcissistic trait, but it doesn't mean that somebody's a narcissist just because they're pride. Pride can be used in a healthy way. For instance, you probably exercise, so you maintain a balanced weight so that you look good. But you don't necessarily go down the gym to the exclusion of your commitments to work and family. That means that your empathic traits keep your narcissistic trait of pride in check. However, should it be the case that an individual goes down the gym without due regard for turning up on time at work or missing a child's school play and is focused on the way that they look, always posing, etc., their pride is not being kept in check by any emotional empathy and is an indicator that that person may well be a narcissist. What is interesting, of course, is that in the situation of Vladimir Putin, we are seeing a link between him and Russia. Naturally, he is the president of that country, and therefore he will see in his world that he embodies the virtues of what Russia is, and also that he will stamp on Russia the mark of Vladimir Putin. The transition after the Soviet collapse proved brutal for most of Russia's population, and while Putin rose swiftly in the political ranks in its aftermath, he did have his own personal problems associated with the fall. As a 37-year-old KGB lieutenant colonel stationed in the East German city of Dresden, Putin watched nervously as angry crowds stormed the city's huge Stasi compound in December 1989, just a few weeks after the fall of the Berlin Wall signalled the end of Soviet control in Europe. Overrunning the offices of the East German secret police, the crowds moved on to its inner sanctum, the KGB headquarters. Putin called for armed backup to protect the employees and the sensitive files hidden inside, but was told no help would come. Moscow is silent, said the voice on the line. He had no choice but to go outside and lie to the crowds that he had heavily armed men waiting inside who would shoot anyone who tried to enter. Bluff, manipulation, assertion of control. The bluff worked, the mob dissipated, and the KGB's files on informers and agents remained safe. Putin felt he was watching one of the largest and most powerful empires the world has ever seen unravel in the most pathetic and humiliating way. I had the feeling that the country was no more, he recalled later in a series of interviews published in 2000. It had disappeared. He seemed to mourn not the human cost or material tribulations, absence of emotional empathy, but the national humiliation of a powerful state simply imploding. It appeared that he cared more about how the Soviet Union looked and how its implosion made him look, as to the ramifications on human cost. Magical thinking, association between him and the Soviet Union. He later claimed to have had a sense for some time that the collapse of Soviet power in Europe was inevitable. But I wanted something different to rise in its place, and nothing different was proposed. That's what hurt. They just dropped everything 
and went away. Threat control. Putin has publicly called the Soviet fall the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century and the death of historical Russia, and that he would reverse it if he had a chance to alter modern Russian history. The fall of the Soviet Union, therefore, weighs heavily upon him. Why? He identified closely, and identifies closely, with the idea of the Soviet Union, its ideology, but also the way that it had exhibited totalitarian control over its own citizens and those of its satellite client states. This is commensurate with the mindset of an individual that needs to assert control, that people, countries, are there to serve the purposes of the individual, the greater glorification of the Soviet Union. During the 1990s, Putin rose from a mid-ranking cog on the periphery of the KGB to become the deputy mayor of St. Petersburg, and then in 1996 was called to Moscow to work for President Yeltsin's Kremlin. He saw close up how weak the new Russia had become. In 1998, when Bill Clinton called Yeltsin to tell him the United States was considering airstrikes in Serbia, Yeltsin was furious. He screamed at Clinton that this was unacceptable, and then hung up. The bombing raids went ahead anyway. Putin was determined that this would not continue, and it was immediately clear that his style was going to be very different to that of Yeltsin. When Bill Clinton's point man on Russia, Strobe Talbot, first met Putin during the late 1990s, the American official found his style completely different from the histrionics or lecturing that he was used to from Yeltsin and other Russian officials. Talbot was struck by Putin's ability to convey self-control and confidence in a low-key, soft-spoken manner, suggests high threshold on ignited fury, suggests an inability to re or a, a lack of need to rely upon the explosion of heated fury. In the future, President also used a number of tricks from his KGB background to show that he was in control, making sure to name drop poets Talbot had studied at university to show he had read Talbot's file. Triangulation, possible calculation, assertion of control. I could imagine him debriefing a captured spy who'd already been softened up by the rougher types, Talbot recalled in his memoirs. This recollection and revelation is interesting because, as we know, we have seen evidence of a thuggishness associated with Putin. But also, is there a more stylized, a slightly more finessed aspect to him and that that would move him away from suggestions that he might be amongst the lessers in terms of a brutal and rudimentary method of assertion of control and that there is, in effect an iron fist in a velvet glove. A few days before he became president in late 1999, Putin wrote an article in the Russian newspaper Neazvizmyr Gazeta outlining his task as he saw it. For the first time in the past 200 to 300 years, Russia faces the real danger that it could be relegated to the second or even the third tier of global powers, Putin warned. He called on Russians to unite to make sure that the country remained what he called a first-tier nation. Grandiosity. To achieve this, Putin turned to history. Russia's recent past had been contradictory, painful and bloody, but Putin was determined that Russians should take pride in their history. Victory in World War II, still known in Russia as the Great Patriotic War, became a kind of national founding myth for the new Russia, character trait acquisition. Through you, we got used to being winners. Competitiveness, Putin told veterans on his first victory day, two days after his inauguration in 2000. With each year, the victory narrative became more pronounced, questioning the darker side of the Soviet war narrative, such as the deportation of two million Soviet citizens during the war, or the ruthless tactics of the Stalin regime on the eve of conflict, became ever more taboo. Putin was determined that Russians should not be made to feel guilty for their past. It is clear that Putin regards himself as Russia and Russia is him. But it goes beyond that. There is a hankering and a desire to return to the glory of the Soviet Union. That the demise of the Soviet Union was a huge threat to control of Putin. And it's something that in fact has become very much wedged in his psyche. That he wants a return to it. And this provides us with insight 
with regard to his current behaviours that have been exhibited with regard to Ukraine. He talked about the fact that Ukraine isn't a proper country. Denial, denigration, invalidation. In effect, he sees it as an object that he is there to take and uses his own. Sense of entitlement, asset appropriation. He talked about that the approach was, in effect, to denazify the Ukraine. Now, it is the case that within Ukraine there are hard right units that might well be neo-Nazi sympathisers or quite possibly viewed as at least aligned with a Nazi mentality. But they are a minority and they do not represent the bulk of Ukrainians. Their existence, of course, provides an opportunity for Putin to talk about this denazification as if the entire country is riddled with some kind of disease that needs him, as the magical liberator, to come riding in and to free Ukraine from this disease. This is a rewriting of the narrative and a revision of history. Note also that he did not talk about how the Ukraine would be occupied, that it wasn't an occupation. Instead, at least at the beginning, of course, it was his intention that he would have a swift victory, that he would be able to remove the government as it stood, install a puppet government, and make it a, pu and make it a client state of Russia, as he began to try to rebuild the former Soviet Union. Of course, as we know, his attempts to blitzkrieg the Ukraine into submission have so far failed, and it's becoming now more of an entrenched war. Note also that there was no reference, of course, to referring to it as a war. Instead, it was a special mission, revision of history, and a diminution of the seriousness of the matter. It's a rewriting of the narrative that is being undertaken to talk about it in such terms as to make it to seem as if the Russians are there as the saviors and liberators is a redressing of the view. And as I've explained to you many times, that when it comes to the concept of good and evil, right or wrong, good and bad, there are no objective standards, and it's simply a matter of perspective. The Ukraine and its allies, and those supporting it, view the Russian invasion as bad, that they have committed an evil act, and that the Ukraine are essentially the forces of good seeking to repel an attack upon their sovereignty. Russia and its fewer allies view the action essentially as not that of evil at all, but that they are doing the good by going into a place which isn't a country of its own and liberating the people that have been held under the yoke of supposed Nazis. It is, once again, differing perspectives. One man's freedom fighter is another man's terrorist. But, his approach with regard to Ukraine is part of this concept that he is Russia and the loss of the Soviet Union hit him in terms of a threat to control hard and because he's reached that position of power that he has done he now seeks to replace what has happened since the fall of the Soviet Union by putting it back together again. His success in Chechnya spurred him on but of course it may well have given him a false sense of confidence, something I shall be addressing in a later part with regard to what is he going to do next. But it is important to look at this concept whereby, as a consequence of him seeing the country as an extension of himself, that its people are an extension of himself, commensurate with that type of thinking of a disordered individual, that although that may well be seen by certain individuals as hugely patriotic, it is part of that mindset whereby what he does is excellent for Russia and that he essentially sees that it is his role, his mission, to restore the Soviet Union which has been unfairly dismantled. From his perspective he doesn't see this as a bad or evil act, he sees it as a righteous one. Pyotin's personal image has evolved to reinforce the narrative of a newly resurgent country. He won Russians over with his calm, no-nonsense approach and tough talking suggests high threshold on ignited fury. Over time, Kremlin spin doctors played up his macho credentials, resulting in a series of photo opportunities that seemed to get more and more absurd. 
Putin at the controls of a race car and a fighter jet, Putin riding a horse bare-chested. Many of you will have, of course, seen that picture. Putin flying a microlide with a flock of rare cranes. There was even a rumour that Putin wanted to be blasted into space to orbit the Earth, but the idea was apparently nixed by Kremlin security, who deemed it too dangerous. As Putin's constructed image approached that of a superhero, magical thinking, his style of rule changed too. The circle of real decision makers around Portin shrank, skewing towards people with the security services background. Portin has prided loyalty above all else, and many of the people around him are those he has known since KGB days, or at least since the 1990s in St. Petersburg. These people almost never talk to journalists, making reliable information about the inner workings of the Kremlin hard to come by. Poitin is a cloistered leader who hardly ever uses the internet and mainly receives information in briefing notes handed to him in red folders by Kremlin aides. When, while he cultivates an image as a man of the people, he has come into contact with real Russians increasingly rarely. Haughtiness, arrogance, seeing himself as set apart, and usually in carefully scripted encounters. Over the years, Portin has made himself synonymous with the new state, extending his presidency more than two decades. During this time, Portin's use of the Second World War has been augmented with other secondary historical figures and victories, as Putin has tried to weave a narrative of Russian glory, starting with the 10th century Prince Vladimir, founder of the Kievan Rus, and ending with the Vladimir currently residing inside the Kremlin. This all demonstrates a grandiosity, an arrogance, a being apart from the people, yet seeing himself as, as those people, a hypocrisy. And this idea of him as Russia and the concept of his views of the former Soviet Union give us added insight into who he is. In part seven, we'll be examining more about his behaviours, looking at his inner circle and his self-imposed isolations, and what those tell us about the man that is Vladimir Putin. <laughs>